So, um, yeah, thank you uh, again for um, inviting me. It's very interesting to hear about all of this amazing um, work that's going on and to try to think about how maybe some of what we've done recently can be um, can can be uh, integrated a bit a bit further with surveillance systems. So my work is is fairly I would say we're we're kind of in early phases of this research. We've just conducted a few pilot studies and are thinking about how to go ahead. So this is um, still still fairly early days for us, but I'm I'm hoping that I can um, maybe learn something from this audience that has more experience in this area. So I, I thought I would just say something briefly about the recent work we've conducted and and mention a, a bit about some follow up studies that are now going on. So this is this is the study that was recently published and I'll spend most of my time on, on this and then a little bit of time on, on um, next steps. So to give a bit of background, I work in northern coastal Ecuador in the um, province of Esmeraldas and, and we work in a number of different communities in the canton of Eloy Alfaro. So we have um, currently conducting dengue surveillance studies in six communities, including some which are kind of moderately urban, such as the town of Borbon, some which are um, rural communities, but accessible by road and, and so somewhat intermediate. And then we have also some communities that are only accessible by river. and. Um, Previously in this region, we didn't see as much uh, dengue transmission in these rural communities. We did see malaria um, into the early 2000s, and then there was a, a bit of a switch over where we began to see much, much less malaria and much more dengue throughout the region. We also work um, somewhat in the city of, of Esmeraldas, but I don't have that shown here because it, it's not part of this particular study. So um, this particular uh, a study was just done in one very, very small community, the community of, of Santa Maria. This is a community of around 150 households and 576 residents. It is about two to three hours boat ride from the nearest urban center, so it's it's quite remote. There are some other towns of similar size nearby, but that's about it. And as far as we know, and based on information shared with us from colleagues at the Ministry of Health, we don't there's no um, known history of dengue in this community. Doesn't mean that it wasn't there, but it, it, until recently, we it wasn't hadn't been observed. Um, hadn't we hadn't observed substantial dengue transmission here? And um, this map, what I aim to show here, is just sort of an interesting feature of the community. So unlike in most of most of the region where we work, communities tend to be entirely Afro-Ecuadorian, or they they might be entirely indigenous Chachi, but it's very rare to see communities like this one that are actually a mixture of, of both ethnic groups together. So in this case, what happened is that there were previously two communities, um, an, an Afro community and a Chachi community that were quite close together, and they eventually just kind of integrated to become one town of, of Santa Maria. But this is, um, as I mentioned, this, is, this isn't very common, so it kind of makes the community a bit unique. And this is just what the community looks like. I'm sure people have seen <laughs> so many kind of pictures like this and um, other other places. But the only thing I'll point out about this, these particular photos is that these are Chachi households. And um, the way that I know, the reason I know they're Chachi households is because of the way they're constructed. So that the Chachi households, that they tend to like to build their houses on stilts uh, like this. That's because, as you might have noticed here, that Chachi houses, this medium gray color, they often are living right along the river. And so because they're living close to the river, there's quite a lot of flooding. And so to, to avoid flooding in the households, they often build wooden houses on stilts. The Afro community, they kind of prefer to live a little bit further away from the river on higher ground. And so you see much more households built of cement and um, without without stilts. So the, the houses up here, kind of in the very top of this photo, at the, at the, those might be, Af those are likely to be Afro houses. And, and so you can see even just walking around that there are these pretty clear differences. Um, you know which, which ethnic group, which neighborhood you're in based on just how the houses are constructed. So in this particular case, the, the study that we, we conducted describes this dengue outbreak, which occurred in 2019. It, we, we have very good information about the outbreak because we, 
you know, working very closely with the Ministry of Health and it's a small community. So they were able to provide a lot of detail about what might have been going on. So initially, we're pretty confident that dengue was probably introduced into the community in February. There were two students from the city of Esmeral um, Esmeraldas who were visiting the community, um, visiting their family during the school holidays, and they were both diagnosed with dengue. Um, and so we think this is when the introduction occurred. Then in, in a few weeks later, in March, we, we saw a few cases, not um, in the town itself, but in one was in a nearby town and one was in another visiting student. And then at that point in um, basically the very end of May, there was, this is when the outbreak actually occurred. So although we think that there was probably uh, circulation going on for all these first couple weeks, it wasn't really picked up until late May. And at this point we had a lot of, of cases. And the, the Ministry of Health responded very aggressively. As soon as there were a large number of cases um, identified, they sprayed every household. And so they, they fumigated very aggressively. And they also provided about the amnitization um, to like every household um, in the community area. So they, they were pretty engaged directly, but unfortunately this wasn't enough to to stop the outbreak. And I have, we can say more about probably why that happened. And by the end of 2019, there had been about 10% um, of the community had had a symptomatic uh, infection. So this was just kind of a chance thing for us. This our my research team that I work with, we, we're engaged in this very large uh, scale, uh, sort of six community study of dengue transmission. And just by chance, just before the outbreak began, we had decided to, that we would like to include this community in our study. So just before the outbreak, we happened to go and do a lot of work to characterize the community in this just the timing just happened to be like that, which was um, fortunate. So here we have our study team visiting the community and they were um, basically just kind of looking to sort of understand what the landscape was. Um, so in the end, we used a couple of different data streams to characterize the outbreak. The Ministry of Health provided us with data about cases that they identified, um, their fumigation um, campaigns, the uh, INSPI, which is the, um, National Public Health uh, Research Institute in Ecuador, they provided and they conducted entomological surveys. And uh, the study team led by the um, Universidad San Francisco de Quito, they conducted active surveillance, laboratory work to determine um, case, the uh, kind of the, the, to confirm dengue. And then we also did this drone mapping, which I'll, I'll talk about the most. So the, the primary results that we found were that, so there was this outbreak around 10% of the community was affected, but the majority of these cases actually were observed in Afro-Ecuadorians, um, even though the Afro population of Santa Maria is smaller than the Chachi population. There are more Chachi households than Afro households. And, and this was really the only very significant um, risk factor we saw for case status. There was a little bit of an association with age, but not much, not much else. And so it was clear that the, that the Afro population probably had a different risk. And so the, the, the intention then of the, of the drone mapping was to try to understand something about why that was the case. Um, this it just shows the same information, but now with the number, the incidence of cases in the community uh, colored in. So you can see that these yellow communities where there were very few cases, these were all Chachi community, uh, neighborhoods. And these darker orange and red communities, these are all the Afro neighborhoods. So uh, clearly there's some difference there. And this red circle is the location where entomological surveys were identifying uh, 80s that were ultimately shown to be positive for for dengue one. So we know that there were there were dengue mosquitoes in this this neighborhood, but they weren't found in other parts of the community. And um, I have circled here the the football field because we think for various reasons that this may have been a key site for the um, epidemic for the outbreak. So we used the drone mapping. This was a pilot activity we hadn't had not done 
drone mapping before, so this is really just um, reflecting on our experiences with trying that out and seeing how it went. We used the, the drones, first of all, for container identification. So you can see here, this is what the image of the community looked like from a distance, uh, from, I mean, from sort of the, the far out version. And then you can actually zoom in on this, this image pretty highly until you see something like figure 4C here, where you can see a couple of uh, covered larger water barrels that are under, under the eaves. And so we use the drone image to map every visible container, uh, water container in the, in the community. We also use the drone image to calculate a vegetation index. In this case, we use GRVI, but um, there are others as well. And so this gives a, a sense of how much green greenery is in the community. And so we, we also measured that. And then looking at those two features, we tried to characterize something of the difference between Afro households and Chachi households, features of the environment that might have been driven, driving the, the difference in disease risk. So one of the things we saw was that um, so Chachi households are substantially larger, the more usually more members than Afro households. They tend to have um, sometimes several several people, live, siblings living together. And so you can sometimes find households of 20, even 20 or 25 people. Um, and so, that, but in this case, it wasn't that sick. But so there's um, slightly larger households and much denser, much, um, though just the population density is higher in general. They tend to have less vegetation surrounding their houses. Maybe that's because there's more people. And they also were storing less water. This is my, maybe partially because they do live closer to the river, so they are a little more likely to use river water, whereas um, people, the Afros, kind of were more likely to prefer rainwater. And they also um, are a little bit more, um, uh, yeah, but anyway, so, they, so, so those were the sort of the primary differences. There was less water storage in the Chachi community. There was less vegetation, higher population density. And in the entomological surveys, we saw much, much, many more um, positive containers were identified in the, the Afro side of the community compared to the Chachi side as well. So that gives us some insight as to what was going on, that probably the built environment of the community was a little bit different between the two neighborhoods, with the Afro side being um, more a, a, a better habitat for, for 80s and as a result of that, that there was probably more likely to be sustained, that the transmission was being sustained in that, in that side of the neighborhood and possibly seeding infections into the Chachi side, but potentially with less sustained transmission on that, on that other side of the community. And so this is all just kind of a, a single experience that we had learning about this technology and trying to think about how to use it. So it's obviously just very preliminary, but I'll provide a few of our insights and, and conclusions to date. So one thing that we, we did find with the, the drone mapping was that it was very useful qualitatively to understand the landscape. That's something we didn't expect initially. I think we were more focused on vegetation indices and trying to identify containers and things like that. But we did find looking back on the outbreak that the map was very useful to understand what was going on and to identify features that we hadn't initially um, I, I hadn't I didn't, initially paid too much attention to. So in this case, the football field was not something that we had initially considered. We hadn't spent a lot of attention um, time mapping the football field or, or really even kind of noting it in our surveys, but it, it did seem like that was the, the center of the, the outbreak. And when we talked to community members, and that was also clear that there were some households that were that were traveling during 2019, and they were um, had those they had kind of locked up their houses so they couldn't easily be accessed by fumigators, um, but they were generating a lot of mosquitoes. And so we think that. The drone was just useful for that. It, you could kind of look at it and understand very well in the community how things were located, even if, if you didn't have direct knowledge yourself. We also felt that um, it was helpful 
in the sense that compared to some of the other methods like remote sensing, which are available. So it, it's very easy to, to do the drone mapping. We were able to, so we trained members of our study team to, to use the drone to collect the maps, but you could, um, in other studies, our collaborators have trained other just members of the community. So really you can, it's, it's pretty easy to pick up and that's a nice feature. And once you have someone who knows how to do it, you can do it with whatever frequency you feel com you like. So, it, it, you know, as opposed to having to be reliant on images collected maybe once a year or once every five years, whatever, you can just do it as, as often as is convenient to you. And, and that's a really nice feature. Um, it's also, I think pretty, it's, it's, there's a low, it's not challenging just to get started and, and try it out. It's, it's fairly, um, easy to pick up, or was easy for for us to pick up as a study team. The the major challenges were administrative because the use of uh, drones is fairly new, both in research. I think people are kind of becoming more comfortable with it for um, recreation, like for for children and that kind of thing. But it's not very well defined. The how to use them in in public health research or surveillance is still not very well defined. The part of Ecuador we work in is right on the border with Colombia and there's a lot of narco trafficking and sometimes drones are used by narco traffickers. Sometimes they're also used by the government in trying to attract track narco trafficking activity. So administratively, we spent a lot of time reviewing the laws around drone use, both in the United States and Ecuador um, in order to get approval to, to do the work, we had to work very closely with the authorities and make sure that all the police were informed well in advance, um, that community leaders were informed well in advance. It was a little bit challenging administratively because the universities weren't used to this kind of research either, so they also didn't really know exactly how to regulate it. Um, and so I think this is something that going forward will be important to clarify because obviously the researchers, we want to obey all of the the, the laws and the guidelines, but if it's not even clear exactly what those guidelines are, it can it can be a little bit um, complicated. So at this point, we're kind of involved in a few next activities, um, which I won't I won't spend too much time on, except to say that we have now done mapping of a few other communities paired with entomology, and so we're hoping to um, directly link drone identified features with entomological features uh, going forward, and um, I think that uh, I, I will just end there, except maybe also to add that our, our team has been also very involved, not in this study, but in others, in trying to integrate the this kind of mapping into what we call like citizen science. So training community members on how to um, fly the drones and provide them with drones directly, and then using that information that they're collecting themselves to um, inform the government of any kinds of um, issues that they might be able to identify through that mapping. And so we're hoping that we can think about how to do that as well. So it's not just us coming in and doing the mapping and then leaving, but that we're kind of working with the community uh, to do it going forward. So um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Lee.